Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here um, today and for supporting Theories in Action in the Curricular Resource Center, uh, the office in, in the college. <laughs> um, I'm Hector. I'm one of the coordinators of Theories in Action. Um, and it is uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce the w one of the second uh, rounds of roundtables, uh, Race, Representation, and the Unreal. Um, and I will allow our um, panelists, our presenters, to introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Lo Smith. I'm a senior, class of 2016. Um, can I have one small request where I ask everyone to fill up those first two rows? Yeah, this is gonna be like a very, it's gonna be a conversation. We want y'all to be engaged. You can like move the chairs around a little bit and do a circle if you want. Hi everyone, thank you for honoring that request. Um, I'm Paige Morris, I'm uh, also in the class of 2016. I'm a literary arts and ethnic studies concentrator. I'm from Jersey City, New Jersey, and I think that's all that's important to know right now. Thank you for coming. Um, this work, okay. Hi, I'm Molly. Um, I am also the class of 2016. I'm from New York City, and I am concentrating in American studies with a focus on gender and sexuality in film and television. Um, and I just want to thank everyone so much for being here. We, I really appreciate it. So yeah, um, I'll just tell you really quickly how the structure of our little chat today will go. Um, so the three of us will just introduce our projects pretty briefly, um, and then we'll ask each other a few questions about our projects and then leave it really open for you all to have a conversation with us about what you think is cool, what you think is weird, anything you have questions on. So yeah, that's how it'll run today. Thank you. So I will be going first. Uh, my project is on um, motherhood in apocalypse movies. And I just wanted to put this quick slide up just to talk, sort of show the, some of the films I'll be talking about. Um, and if you don't want to be spoiled, you should probably leave um, <laughs> just saying that. Um, yeah. um, so this is my project. I called it Children of Woman, um, Motherhood in Apocalypse Film and Television. Um, and I chose that title because of, um, there's a film called Children of Men from 2006 by Alfonso Cuaron, um, which is one of the films I talk about. And it basically, it's, it's very problematic in a lot of ways. And it raised, it's one of the films that raised the big question for me, um, which is what I tried to answer through this. This is my honors thesis. Um, and the big question I tried to answer is why in so many apocalypse film, um, and why in so many apocalypse movies and television shows, is the mother specifically wounded in some sort of way, either raped or killed or has her children taken away from her. Um, you'll find that almost invariably in any of a film or television show you see in this genre, um, including if you, know, if you watch The Walking Dead, I know a lot of people do. Um, a lot of, you know, every single mothering figure either has, her, has had her child killed or is dead herself. Um, whereas the show, as like in the movie, in the film The Road, um, the show itself is centered around a father-son relationship. Um, so there's a lot of disparity between that, and I sort of wanted um, to figure out why that happened um, and just to um, learn more about these movies. Um, so first of all, I wanted to ask sort of what is apocalypse? Um, because when you think of apocalypse, I guess, at least I, when I, before I began this project, I thought of it as a, you know, the end, like a lot of people do, the end of the world, the la you know, the end of everything. Um, but clearly, if these films are post-apocalyptic, that means that something else is happening because you can't have stories after the end if the end is actually the end. Um, so that was one question. And so I read a book by a man named James Berger who wrote that um, according to James Berger, the, there are two definitions for the word apocalypse. It's either the actual imagined end of the world, or it's the end of something, a way of life or knowing. 
Um, and that leads also to the definition of the word apocalypse, which comes from the Greek, I'm not gonna try to pronounce it, um, but the Greek word meaning revelation, uncovering a lifting of the veil, um, which is in, in my thesis I posit as oppositional to the word revolution, which is in terms of going back to something that had already happened, whereas revelation is sort of um, an exploration of something new or an uncovering of knowledge that has always been there but has not been explored before. Um, and yes, and also um, on that slide as well, there was um, that apocalypse films are more about survival than they are about death, um, which is not true for all of them, but that tends to be the general gist, and that's usually based upon a sort of a heteronormative futurity based on heterosexuality um, and on the nuclear family, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so one of the big theorists I talk about was Lee Edelman um, and his figuration of the child. Um, and so his main thesis is that heterosexual futurity is invested in the figure of the child and that we can't imagine a politics or even you know a, a, an imagination without this figure of the child as a future to invest in and you know, as a child is based clearly in heterosexual relations this is oppositional to a queer politics which he says would reject the child as um, a figurehead and would be anti-futurity, anti-, -futurity, anti um, reproduction in the heterosexual sense. Um, and he has been criticized for using this, the overarching word of the queer as a substitute for white male homosexual. Um, he doesn't attend to issues of race. Um, for example, um, it could be argued that black children and children of color in general are not considered an innocent scene as continuously under siege by the media or by American culture writ large. Um, and he also doesn't account for the mother's place in the system. Um, in the fact that the child is worshipped as the symbol of futurity, um, but the mother creates the future or produces the future, and yet is left out of his reckoning. Um, and so my, chat, my thesis was split into three chapters, um, the nuclear family, the mother, and the revelation. Um, and so in the nuclear family, I talked about um, three films, but I'll talk about two here. Um, and basically what I found out is that the fate of the family the fate of the world basically seems to rest on the fate of the family. Um, for example, in this film, On the Beach, which was, I think, 1959, um, it is basically about there's this nuclear fallout, and the only surviving humans live in Australia, um, which has its own connotations of, you know, you can think about that. Um, but, and so it's basically, there's a cloud of radiation coming that's going to kill off everybody. And basically the film is them having these, you know, just, sort of reckoning with this disaster that's gonna happen. And this is one of the final scenes where Peter and his wife Mary are talking about the suicide pills they're gonna take and give to their daughter um, before the radiation cloud comes. And the fact that this film ends with such a sort of a heterosexual union that's so totalizing and so perfect in a Hollywood sense um, gives the film a sense of hope that even beyond the end of the world, it feels like there are things to be reproduced. Um, whereas there are films such as Threads, which I think came out a little bit later, um, which ends basically with a dead child, um, which has a lot of different connotations, and it leaves the viewer feeling much more, much less hopeful um, in a reproductive sense. And so, oh, I hope you can read the quote. Um, it's not very important. Um, but anyway, um, for the chapter, the mother was sort of the center of my thesis, um, and it was very theory heavy but it examined the mother's position in particular in the matrix of hope and futurity. Um, I used a lot of psychoanalysis to talk about this, especially Diane John Pace, um, who has a revisionist reading of Freud, um, which basically talked about how his, um, his famous Oedipal complex is based on, sort of on the usually male sons, usually the son's um, antagonism against the father, but then he doesn't really talk about antagonism against the mother or matricide itself is seen as sort of taboo. Um, and when he does talk about it, he sort of backs away from that theorizing, which seems to suggest that it's part of the unconscious of his own theory. Um, and so I focused on films such as 28 Weeks Later, Children of Men, and The Road um, to figure out how the mother functions within these narratives. And I discovered, especially in 28, 28 Weeks Later and The Road, the mother is villainized for failing to be a proper mother. Um, for example, in this scene, it's very graphic, so I didn't want to show the actual scene. Um, 
in essence, the mother is a carrier of the rage virus disease, um, which means she's infected, but she doesn't have symptoms. Her husband doesn't know this. Her husband had left her for dead, so she's very angry. Um, and so she, unwit she knowingly gives him the virus. Um, but the movie plays her as a bit of a dupe because she is strapped to a hospital bed, now in, locked in a room with a rage monster, who immediately begins to kill her in an extremely violent, extremely intimate, incredibly sexually suggestive way. Um, and you can see from his expression after seeing her killed, it's not, you know, this is an extremely intimate act. It's not just something he's doing because he became a rage monster. It's directed against the wife, against the mother in particular. Um, and so in my third chapter, I talked about Mad Max Fury Road, which if you aren't familiar with the film, um, it's the fourth film in um, George Miller's Mad Max series. It's extremely different from the first three. Um, for one thing, Tom Hardy plays Max instead of Mel Gibson, which thank God. Um, <laughs> and um, this changes a lot about Max's character, but really the most important part of this chapter of my thesis was that um, I talked about sort of the celebration of difference that happens in this film. Um, like for example, in the lower left you see um, Furiosa, who's the main female character, with the Vuvulini, who are these older women who are sort of separated from the um, dictatorship that is the sort of the central um, political party, or, you know, political center of the film. Um, and there's this incredible scene where they meet the wives, who are these five, you know, played by models, typically beautiful women, um, and they have this, they basically meet with these older women, and you expect them to sort of be wary of each other, but it's an ex extremely celebratory moment um, in which they laugh, they are like, you know, there's one part where one of them, one of the older women opens the, small, the younger woman's mouth, and it's like, wow, she has all her teeth, this is amazing, um, and it's just, um, extremely celebratory moment, and so it opens these ideas of the celebration of difference as a possibility of a way to achieve a better world, as well as a livable future. Um, and so, oh, this is sort of small, but it was basically the final, one of the final paragraphs from my thesis. Um, and basically it talks about how to, you know, the ways to overcome trauma um, in its cultural sense, in an individual sense, cannot be done through an imagination of complete unity or complete totality. It has to be done in a way that is fragmented, is broken, is, you know, wild, is not, you know, it's messy. Um, and so my big question was, including, you know, women of color, women of any sort of status, mothers, etc., how do we make these futures, all of them individual, an experience that is livable, even beyond the end of the world? Um, and so that's basically my thesis. Hi everyone, I'm Paige again. Um, so my project that I wanna talk about is really linked to these questions about um, how to narrate experiences and how experiences are represented. So my project, I'm gonna title it Race, Memory, and the Magical Real. And essentially, I'm talking about my honors thesis in literary arts, which was a collection of short stories in the tradition of magical realism. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more later about what magical realism is and why that's important for this project. Magical realism um, is a literary genre that casually inserts elements of the fantastical into the real or everyday world. Um, and a little bit of history on magical realism, the literary movement was formed in Latin America in response to European colonial violence. Um, it's often described as a post-colonial movement, um, though the, the remnants of that colonial violence are ongoing. And so I think um, just to pinpoint the start of it, the first wave started in the 1960s and 70s, and from then on it's been a continuation. This genre has um, also had a second wave that went outside of Latin America um, where other writers from the margins of their respective societies, including a lot of Greek writers, for example, a lot of um, American writers, a lot of Jewish American writers, also um, decided to take this framework and apply it to the narratives that they were telling. Um, and that second wave happened in the 1990s and is still ongoing now. Um, so magical realism as a genre is known for privileging disorder and magic over order and rationalism. 
Um, and this is where you can see the response to um, European colonialism in terms of colonialism um, as a system of oppression that creates orders, creates structures, creates hierarchies, um, and sort of limits the ways that people can navigate their societies. Um, so magical realism as a literary genre is a way of disrupting that. Um, it's, it's really about non-linearity. It's really about um, inserting the bizarre, the strange, into these everyday situations and disrupting what we think of as everyday. Um, so telling stories from a perspective that is not the colonial perspective, is not um, a structured perspective, is really what the genre is about. So yeah. Um, I'm currently taking a course at the Rhode Island School of Design on magical realism, and my professor sums it up in this way by saying, magical realism takes the familiar and turns it strange. So, yeah. um, some of the well-known examples um, that I'm drawing on are um, 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, Beloved by Toni Morrison, and Maxine Hong Kingston's The Woman Warrior. Um, and I choose these examples especially because um, magical realism is now a genre that I think a lot of writers of color um, are drawn to for telling their experiences and their histories. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about myself being one of those writers of color as well. So yeah, um, an overarching question for me as I approach the task of writing um, these short stories and knowing that I wanted to frame them all through this lens of magical realism um, was the question, of how do we make sense of things like genocide, things like slavery, um, things like violence, systems of oppression? Um, how do we make sense of those and how do we write narratives about those experiences? Essentially, how do we write about the unspeakable? Um, so the examples that I showed, um, for example, Beloved is a novel by Toni Morrison that deals with slavery and its aftermath and the incredible violence um, of the enslavement of black people in the US, um, but also other types of violence that also occur in simultaneously with that, so gender violence, sexual violence. Um, and essentially, the question for magical realist writers is often, how do you write those stories um, in a way that doesn't reproduce that violence or just make people relive that violence in reading it? Um, and the answer is that you don't. So you can't really um, write these stories in a way um, that makes sense of them because there is really no sort of logic oftentimes to the kinds of violence that a lot of writers of color in the magical realist tradition are writing about. Um, there's no way to really make sense. And so what a lot of writers do um, is use magical realism as a way to avoid trying to make sense or avoid trying to make these narratives um, linear, trying to structure them in the predict like predictable ways, um, give them traditional plots, give them stock characters. Um, magical realism is a way to disrupt that and say you don't need to tell the story this particular way if you can't do that, if you can't um, vocalize it in that way. So that's where my project comes from. Um, so the short story collection that I wrote is called Incantations, and it's a collection of four short stories um, that all follow different characters of color as they navigate um, violence, um, inequality associated with a number of their identities. So I made a table because that's less confusing, I guess, but um, these are the four stories and essentially I, I look at the protagonist, the forces that they're reckoning with in their society and the response through a magical realist lens. So one of the stories I wrote is called Bees and it follows a young black girl in rural North Carolina, um, and she is navigating, of course, black identity, identity as a woman, but especially at navigating the threat of sexual violence um, in her particular community and the restrictions on her mobility in terms of where she's located in the rural South. Um, and in order to address that, I think, um, I thought a lot about protections. I thought a lot about safety for young black women. Um, and I thought an intervention into this story would be to give her the protections that are often not actually afforded um, to young black women in communities like the one that I was writing about. So she has a horde of killer bees that follow her around and protect her from um, the men in her community that want to impose violence on her. Um, and that the story essentially follows her as follows her and this swarm of bees as she attempts to navigate that violence and break away from it, um, and essentially looks at um, 
what sorts of protections can be created or can be formed um, through means outside of just the norm. So if there are no legal protections, for example, if there are no physical people there to protect you, what happens then? And what's like the magical realist response to that? So in this case, it was a bunch of bees. Um, I also have a story called Family History that looks at um, diaspora and questions of um, memory and what happens when you don't have a linear story um, to tell about where you come from or um, to tell about how you got to be here. Uh, so that story deals a lot with ghosts and deals a lot with not knowing. So the entire story is structured as a response to a writing assignment in a class where a student is asked to write about their family history. Um, and I decided to look at <clears throat> an experience outside of my own as well. So this experience is of a first generation um, Korean immigrant in the US with her family. And her response to this assignment is that she doesn't know a lot about her family history. There are a lot of silences and a lot of gaps. And how she responds to that is to talk about what she does know and what she guesses. Um, and a lot of times to talk about ghosts um, because those are sort of the stories that she does have of her family history. Um, so the magical realist intervention there is when you don't have a history or you don't have a linear story, how do you invent one? Um, yeah. The next story I want to talk about is Taffy, which is a story about um, a multiracial black girl in Bermuda living, living and working in a tourist town. Um, and there are a lot of issues I wanted to explore here about um, women and colorism and histories of colonialism as well. Um, but essentially, this story is about a young woman who um, is sort of dealing with the, the impacts of colorism in her community and um, being a darker-skinned person in a family where um, her lighter-skinned sister is privileged um, and favored. The ways that she tries to navigate that include um, trying to get really good at the craft of making saltwater taffy um, as one tactic. And she's not successful in doing that, and her response a lot of that, a lot of the time, is a kind of rage that I think is different from the typical, like, I hate my sister, I'm so jealous of my sister rage. So in the story, that rage often takes the form of controlling water, um, like summoning storms, things like that. Um, so I wanted to look at um, a sort of anger that is about a lot more than just the surface level, um, sort of petty. Um, sibling rivalries that I imagine go on and look at um, how, that, how that anger is the result of so much more than that and how I can make it something that's so much more than that in the story. Uh, and then finally, the last story in the collection is called Blood. And it, this, I think, is the story that is most, um, it resembles my own experiences the most. So I was trying to write stories about characters who come from a lot of identities and backgrounds that I hold, but also characters who don't and look at the ways that those experiences overlap. Um, but this story is especially, it hits especially close to home. Um, it's about a young black woman who grew up in a low-income community in the Northeast. It's unnamed, but it's basically Jersey City. And um, it looks at um, her leaving that community to go to college um, in an unnamed Northeast university. Um, and then coming back and trying to grapple with um, a lot of guilt, a lot of feelings of having left and let people down. Um, and in this story, she comes back and um, it sort of has to confront a friend that she left behind when she went away to college who is grappling with an unnamed um, blood disorder. Um, and in the story, she, she, so she sort of has to ask questions about what she believes because She's technically a witch, low-key. Like, it's not named, but low-key, she's a witch. Um, and there's a lot of magic that she used to rely on and used to be really certain of um, the effects that it had and the ways that it could make her world better, easier to navigate. If she was having difficulty, she could just have herself and her grandmother, who she lives with, um, make a potion for it or make some sort of charm. Um, but her experiences at this university and then coming back home make her question how real that magic is and like whether or not she actually has ways to navigate um, a lot of the things that she tried to escape by leaving. Um, so when she comes back home, she still sees that her community is just as, um, just as low income, just as run down as when she left it. Her friend's blood disorder has no cure, essentially. Um, and so 
I looked at things like black home remedies and witchcraft um, as a way to try to, re try to um, fight back against those things that just seem to be impenetrable. Like it seems like there's no solution to those things. Um, so that was a story that felt really personal to me and it was important that um, in all of these stories it was especially important to try to think about how to resist what is the status quo and to resist the norms of inequality that are happening across these stories. So there's issues of class, there's issues of gender, a lot of violence going on, um, and what are some ways to, to intervene there or try to um, imagine ways to fight back against those inequalities. So yeah, so in the end, um, I was looking at questions like what might be lost or missing when we tell or when we try to tell these strictly linear stories um, about experiences that are not linear or don't make any sense at all, like all those sorts of violence that I talk about in those stories before. Um, and also, what do we gain when we add this element of the fantastical? Um, what can we learn when we have stories that are about very real violences, um, but don't read like real stories, read almost like myths or fairy tales? And how can, yeah, how can an incorporation of those fantastical elements allow us to better understand or grapple with the social realities that we're living in? Um, so I, I also just wanted to say, like, I think recently something like Beyonce's Lemonade um, is a way that I saw, you know, a black woman trying to make sense of just a ton, like, an overwhelming amount of oppression and inequality and just hurt through using um, a lot of the elements that I talk about in my own stories too. So I, I like firmly support Beyonce as a magical realist writer as well. And if that helps you think about like how you can talk about painful experiences in non-traditional ways, I think that's a really good example. Hi, I'm Lo. <laughs> I'm pulling up my description tab to read to y'all right now. Um, I am a double concentrator in visual art and public health, so my work deals heavily with medical experimentations and reckoning the trauma sustained to black bodies over the last 500 years. Um, my work has three major themes. One, medical experimentations of the past. Two, like my current life story and navigating the like, very harsh realities of being a queer black woman and three, Afrofuturism, which I see as both a uh, speculative fiction and like an escapist tactic for me. So my Afrofuturist works often heavily involve themes of the current, this current moment, including like Black Lives Matter, Sandra Bland, and just police brutality, as well as reckoning, reckonings with past medical experimentations like J. Marion Sims. Are y'all familiar with J. Marion Sims? Nods, heads, shakes. Father of Gynecology, really messed up dude, um, established a experimental medical hospital in his backyard, bought and borrowed about 14 enslaved black women and did vaginal experiments on them. And he's the one who invented the specula and the surgery, a, surgery called a surgery called vaginosal fistulas, which is when you sew wire into the vagina to close a gap that happens during um, childbirth. So when someone births a child, sometimes their uterus and their bladder rips and this man came up with the surgery to fix that um, by experimenting on black women without anesthesia. So that is where my work is based in. That's where the medical experimentation aspect comes in. Um, and kind of my response to this, my Afrofuturist response to this trauma and this project I've been working on for the past four years um, is Bidlot 1951. So this is an installation art exhibit that exists on the second floor of List Arts Building, which all of you should check out mm -hmm. on Monday. Um, that includes several aspects. There's sculpture, there's paintings, there's an audio tour that explains the um, fictive world that this installation is happening on. And yeah. And so I combine theories around blackness with like artistic processes so this is my body, this is a body print, but also the poster for my show. Um, an example of my work. So this is a body print where I painted my own body. I enlisted the help of my roommates who are really wonderful people, shouts out to them, um, to lay me down on a piece of paper and like pull me back up so I could get a clean print. Um, I then scanned this. 
ran it through several Photoshop filters, distorted it, and discolored it. Um, and this is an example of how like, the black body is processed and consumed in this contemporary moment, but in my futuristic world, which is called the love, um, is also existent and how blackness is existent in the future. The, the text isn't super clear, but again, second floor of bliss, <laughs> five, five, oh, better? Second floor of list on Thursday, there's going to be a reception where all y'all can come check out the work and take the audio tour, which is going to be very, it's a very immersive experience. So I'm going to talk about this project now, but like I highly encourage y'all to go check out the installation if you have time. This is not my community next. So what is Afrofuturism? Oh, the boxes here are small. Um, Mark Dury is a author and writer, and he coined, coined the term Afrofuturism in an essay called Black Speculative Fiction. Um, or Black Futures, oh, it, it switched. All right. So that is my presenter description. That's not actually the, that's not actually the definition. Okay, give me one second. How's it appear on yours? So my slide looks different than your slides right now. We're having a little technical difficulty. Can I just refresh it? Yeah, I would just refresh it. Yep, that's what it's hey. supposed to look like. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. A little review, magical <laughs> realism, dope lots shit, of lots of animations. Wow. Yes, that's what it's <laughs> supposed to look like. There we go. Um, <laughs> so Afrofuturism was a term called, coined by Mark Dury um, in the essay Black to the Future, interviews with Samuel R. Delaney, Greg Tate, and Trisha Rose. Greg Tate and Trisha Rose are also professors here, so they've had a huge impact on my work. Gregory Tate, also known as Tater Tots, is um, a writer, a musician, who like heavily influenced the conceptualization of this work in his class, Afrofuturism in the Africana department. Um, so speculative fiction, Afrofuturism is a special speculative fiction that treats African American themes and addresses African American concerns in the context of 20th century techno culture, but I take it 21st century, 22nd century techno culture, um, and more generally African American signification that, appro that appropriates images of technology in a prosthetically enhanced future. So the part that I'm very interested in is that prosthetically enhanced futures part. Um, so Afrofuturism isn't just black people in the future, it's what are the legacies of what's happening right now, black people and people of color in the future. It's not just the what, what's the legacies of happening right now, but what are the possibilities? So it's definitely an escapist tactic of what can we imagine ourselves out of right now and as like a queer community, as a POC community, um, and what are the possibilities for our futures? And I think there's something very radical and real about declaring this will be the future and this is what it will look like um, as a way to cope with current trauma. And can you go to the next one? Mm -hmm. World building themes and so a lot of my work is around both writing and creating visual pieces that like make the writing make sense. Um, so I have uh, lots of different themes within my work, including black survival, dystopian futures, consumption of the black body, family, lineage, and medical experimentation, all of which I've talked about a little bit. Um, so in this final installation piece, there's seven pieces. The first one being an audio tour of the entire installation <laughs> that declares the narrative of this new world. So the installation is set in the year 2984, and all, everyone who goes to visit it is an uh, inhabitant of this new world called the love. So there's a narrative that you're already aware of because you're living on the love if you're seeing this installation in the year <laughs> 2984. Um, but while going through each installation and while listening to the audio tour, that f further builds the narrative and further establishes this world. So there is a necklace made out of human teeth and lace. There is a, a mattress-sized iPhone sculpture called Do Not Disturb. There are body prints. There are the original body file print, which is a piece of cut acrylic with that body print from the first slide. Um, that contains the entire genome of everyone who left Earth in these pod capsules. Um, and there was a great, great flood, so if you go to the next one. 
So this is the intro, so if y'all can take a moment to read it, I'll go through the pieces that are within it, and again, highly encourage people to visit the show. So I'll just pause so y'all can take that in. If y'all just wanna look at me when you're done reading, can you tell I teach? <laughs> I get half the eyes in the room. I also like eye contact. Okay, cool. So this is the intro to the piece when you walk in. Um, the pieces, the series of pieces are called Family Tree. It's a wall size installation, 18 feet by seven feet, um, or eight feet on one wall. Um, and that is representing the survival of this capsule that left Earth, um, whose name is AES, and AES breaks out of their hypersleep um, after the capsule is very close to Delove and discovers that everyone else who lived on this capsule that's been traveling for two generations is dead, so kind of loses their mind a little bit. Um, and family trees are a way to keep track of line lineage and heritage, but also very crucial aspects of, of these capsules because they track who lives on them in space. Um, so this wall size piece is AES's destruction of the family tree of the capsule that got lost, which that tells you about. We have Pearly Whites, which is that necklace. We have the black box recording of people on the flight and when it did get pushed off course. Um, we have 13 Commandments, which are the covenants of the Black Lives Matter movement. So there's 13 of those, and those are the commandments for this new world. And there's a uh, laser cut acrylic piece about that. Um, I have the bed I mentioned before. I have prints of the corrupted body files, the first of which you saw on that poster. And I have journals of people on the missing flight and how they tracked each other and how they use their personal narratives, star charts, travel journals, spell books. So all of those physical items exist in the show. And there should be one more slide. And that is the installation piece on the second floor of Bliss. Thank you all so much for coming and listening to us talk about our work. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation that's going to come up next. Thank you all again. Um, so I guess at this time, we can open it up to questions that we have for one another or questions from the audience. If anyone wants to start us off, that would be really cool. initial thought. I love the fact that the three of you are on this uh, round table together because there is this kind of theme that runs throughout. Um, maybe my question is, as you listened to each other, what did you I can start. So I was writing through both y'all's presentations because it just makes you think of so many things. They're so cool, aren't they? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so a lot about motherhood and how we think about like family and bloodlines and like passages of like one passages and themes like mothers in your movies get treated the same way in different movies. Um, so like in this in popular culture now, how motherhood is treated, but also how black women aren't allowed to access their children in a certain way and like through police brutality. And I had like a series a while ago about black motherhood. So like that just really popped out. And like how your characters evolve through your stories and how it's different characters, but it's kind of the same character too um, in each of your story. <laughs> so that's what popped up at me. I, was, I, mean, I also thought a lot about how all three of our sort of deal with um, the issue of representation of trauma, which I think is really interesting. I mean, one of the, I mean, really the biggest regret of my thesis is that I didn't have the time or space to get into the issues of race um, that were inherent, really, and even in the film, most of the films 
had no characters of color, but I, you know, I still could have gotten into that, into those issues. Um, that's the biggest regret of my thesis. Um, but I still think that our three, um, our three projects are united across this idea of representation of trauma, um, whether it's trauma, gendered trauma, racial trauma, um, trauma of memory. Um, and most of my films are not contemporary. A lot of them come from, you know, the Cold War era, which, you know, in America at least, that was the time of racial uprisings as well as, you know, in the white, in middle class white communities, incredible repression of gendered, um, you know, gendered roles. Um, so to see this evolution across time of different kinds of ways of working through trauma, of the white male psyche who made most of these films working through trauma, um, and as well as the trauma inherent within the piece. Um, I don't know, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think both of you are super cool, and I thought a lot about um, how we're all sort of working, or trying to work outside of the world that we actually exist in right now, and trying to work towards something, I guess, in the future, or something that has not been thought of yet. Um, so I thought a lot about, like when Molly, when you were talking, when your question um, ended on how we can create like livable futures, um, and then like Lowe's installation also dealing with that question, especially in the context of like how we can create a livable future for black people in particular. Um, I think that's something that also comes up in, in my reading and writing of magical realism. Um, I think a lot about what, what the world actually looks like and why I use fiction so often as an escape from that and trying to imagine something different, um, which shows just like how much work there is to be done on the world that we actually exist in. Um, so listening to both of you, I thought a lot about um, the futures that we're trying to create through this work and trying to imagine through the work as well. Thank you for the question, Peggy. Any other questions? Comments, thoughts? Hi, hi Stanley. <laughs> Really good question, thank you. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I guess to address the first part about how I got interested in magical realism, I, hmm, I struggled for a long time trying to think of how to define magical realism. I think a lot of people have stricter definitions than I do, um, but I essentially look at it as literature um, speaking from the margins in a way that disrupts what we think of as normal. Um, and I thought that was really important when I first encountered, um, I guess the first magical realist books I read were Toni Morrison's and then books like um, like Everything is Illuminated by Jonathan Safran Foer, um, reading 100 Years of Solitude. And that those were the first books where I saw realities that I could connect to. I read a lot of literature growing up, but it was often those like very traditionally plotted literatures and like the characters were all the same across the board as well. Um, and then when I tried to think about like myself as a writer, for a long time I could only write the sorts of stories that I read which had nothing to do with me. Like I'd know nothing about like these fantasy series with like white men in them or like um, any books just where everyone was white and everything was fine by the end. Um, I couldn't connect to that and so I wanted to shift my writing in a way where I could talk about um, experiences that I could connect to and people that I grew up around, people that, whose stories I felt like I knew and the only way that made sense to me to do that was not to do it in the, in the way that I had seen these stories that didn't represent me at all. So I got really interested just in using um, 
things like witchcraft, not, not, I don't practice witchcraft, but like using witchcraft in a story to explain um, how like a black woman might deal with something differently than I don't know what happens in like other books, but um, that's sort of how I came around to doing that. And then the second part of your question was, Okay, yeah. People don't understand me a lot of the time and I don't understand myself, but I feel like, I think I, I have an idea in my mind of what I'm working toward and I think it's hard for a lot of people to understand, um, especially a lot of the spaces I've been involved in at Brown um, are writing spaces that are predominantly white um, and don't really have, have not encountered stories about people who are not white, let alone stories that are also weird in other, like in, uh, con unconventional in other ways as well. And so there's just like a lot of barriers to trying to understand what I'm doing most of the time. Um, and like most of my feedback at Brown has been, this is really weird, what are you doing, tone it down? Or it's like, why is this person black? What is going on here? And it's like essentially everything, like all of the ways that I approach trying to write about these kinds of stories just can't be accessed by a lot of the people I happen to be around. Um, and so I've had to sort of think about then who am I writing them for and a lot of the time it's for me and it's for people who like will recognize themselves in those stories or who will not, I think there's like a barrier in terms of the magic realism element that doesn't come up a lot when people of color read what I write um, and I think that's interesting like why is it so easy for us to like you know dispel like suspend our disbelief and try to like enter this different way of seeing the world. Um, so the response from most people has been, what are you doing? I guess it sounds nice, that's great, good luck. And the response from like a lot of people of color who have read it has been like, thank you so much for like, like telling that story or like I see myself in that story, which has been really nice. Um, I think I've had, I have a very similar <laughs> response to pages <laughs> on both accounts. Um, so like why the futuristic Afrofuturism aspect? Um, because of Beloved and because of Octavia Butler, which is the image I showed, um, and because of Samuel Delaney, who's a black queer author who wrote like volumes and volumes and volumes of sci-fi. Those were the first narratives that I read that I could really relate to and like, really see myself in. And Samuel Delaney is this author who does this cool thing where like one of his books doesn't use gender at all and you just have to deal with it, but you don't notice it till the end. Um, he just like, uses characters' names and like group pronouns. Um, I think that was one of the first works where I was like, wow, I see myself. I could be m easily read myself into this versus like, this is someone else's story that I'm just participating in as a viewer. Um, so I think that's why I chose Future, because, or like why I chose to explore like Afrofuturism. Um, also as a way to deal with trauma and like I daydream a lot and a way to escape this current reality, but in a constructive way of like really imagining futures. Um, and I would get teased by my family a lot for being really idealistic. So as, even as a young child, I had to like, justify everything I said with like, a plan. Um, and I think I really enjoy planning in that way. Um, and that's, so like, if I enter into a future space where like, I am the one who gets to decide everything and I, as a black queer person, gets to control everything, like, that sounds great to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, that, so it's like, definitely a coping tool for me, too. Um, and the, what's the response been? Very similarly, that where a lot of people are like, this is, this is cool, but I like, <laughs> don't quite get it. Or I get a lot of people who do like Google the shit I talk about after I talk about it in my work, um, which is fun actually. Like I did a work, a piece about, um, about the Audre Lorde project in Kitchen Table Press, which is this queer printing press from the 70s, and someone like Googled it and then watched Paris is Burning afterward, and they're like, I just watched Paris is Burning because of you. And I was like, that's pretty dope. <laughs> um, so there's, I have to kind of strike a balance between my content being relevant to me, but also like as an artist doing like technically challenging things, um, like things that are like actually pushing my field and pushing my art and not just relying on the content, which is like very important to me and why I make work. But also, like, if I'm making a book, like, making sure that book is, like, a bomb-ass book. <laughs> um, so I get kind of a mixed response. Like, this is technically beautiful, but I don't understand why you did it mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, but there's been a lot of support within the art department of my work. So that's been really nice. Yeah, um, I think it's really interesting. It's been really interesting to me to think about sort of the personal aspects of writing an academic thesis. Um, because a lot of what academia is, is sort of like, you know, separating yourself from the work that you're doing and putting yourself at a critical distance, which I think is what I tried to do 
Um, and I think one of the issues I struggled with while writing this thesis was, you know, okay, I figured out, you know, how, you know, in Freud's formulation, the, mother, the dead mother's body is eroticized and fetishized, and that's terrible, and maybe that explains why so many white male writers write the mother suffering in this way, but what does this actually have to do with real life? Um, but I think that the two threads of my research, the motherhood and the apocalypse, sort of come from very different places. I feel like the motherhood is a very, is a much more personal place. I've just, it's something that I just started writing about academically very early in my academic career. It just happened. Um, and I have postulations why that I don't really want to get into in this forum. Um, but the apocalypse really, my, you know, my thought process is that, you know, in this imagined future where everything is destroyed, you know, social structures are gone, uh, you know, ostensibly oppressions that have been structured for millennia are collapsed, you know, society has dis disappeared. Why in these films and these TV shows do we still see people of color being killed off? Why do we still see mothers being brutalized? Um, and that's a question of representation and sort of like the question of where representation intersects with reality I think is really important because representation in terms of, you know, um, magic and in terms of fiction is where I've always gone to escape my own personal traumas. And so I think seeing the traumas of the real world reflected in your escapist um, pieces is problematic and it sucks. Um, and it, you know, it makes me wish at least that there were more people that sort of better understood what they were actually doing when they're writing these pieces and how much impact it has. Like I believe that you two really understand the impact that your pieces have and I think that's really incredible um, to have people who understand the artistic impact. Um, and I guess in terms of like responses to my piece, it's just basically been like, what the fuck are you doing? Because <laughs> um, it's mostly been <laughs> talking with like older relatives or like people I've like job interviews. I have just been like, whoa, that's interesting. But like, you know, why? And it's, very, it's, it's still difficult to explain to myself like why. Like I think I'm, I think I'm still working through that. Um, but I just find it interesting. And I think it's important, so. I have one last thing to add that you made me think of, like kind of the community response. Have you all heard of silent crypts? So there's this thing that happens at RISD and that happens in all art classes where someone doesn't understand your work. So like a crit is when people, you, people in your class review your work. Um, and they're supposed to give you feedback. So it's something that like, particularly happens to people of color is a silent crit where no one says anything. Um, and that happens less so at Brown than it does at RISD, but it happens in both places. And, it, and if you all want to check it out, um, RISD just RISD students just made a video about silent crits called The Silent Room, kind of riffing off of like, a room of one's own. Um, that's about the fact that like, people don't know how to respond to our work. And I think y'all have made really, really powerful work that like, I feel you when people like, don't know how to respond to it and they just like, look at it. <laughs> and like, this is cute. But <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. Yeah, thank you for that question. Any others, thoughts, feelings? We all have a lot of feelings. <laughs> I'm sure y'all do too. I plan to be in the MoMA one day. <laughs> um, so like, that's like the dream. Um, and I think I continue to make like very personal, very specific work that I want to force everyone to see. Um, 
for that reason. Like, you will see my narrative, you will see my blackness. We will put this in like a national conversation, a national dialogue. And it's gonna be oddly specific, and there's gonna be stuff like in Lemonade like you don't understand, and that's okay. <laughs> and, like, that's part of it. Um, I think that's where I see. So I'm currently submitting my works everywhere. Like, I also, since I clearly write in order to explain what I'm doing, I'm submitting papers to like different academic journals, different art fairs. I'm interested in selling work. Um, lots of artists do like kind of personal work and then commercial work to like make profit, but I like want it to be one and the same. Um, so yeah. Um, my thesis is gonna get deleted from my computer immediately after I just send it out to people who want to read it. Um, well, no, I think I'll, I'll hold on to the stories, but I don't. I'm like actually really opposed to trying to publish them anywhere right now, and I think it's largely because a lot of the response I've gotten so far has convinced me that I don't think folks are really ready. And I think that's why I write the stories, though, is like I want to be able um, to eventually get to a place where I can write these stories, like you said, like for an audience that will not understand them a lot of the time. Um, because a lot of the reason I wrote them is because I think about that issue of representation is that the ways in which, like if I ever do see representation, there's like a specific way to tell a black story, for example, and there's a specific way to tell a story about like a city, like the city I come from. Um, and I don't want to be telling that same story. Um, no, like for the personal reasons of I don't think there's anything productive for me in just like rehashing what I already know to be true and what, like, what I live every day. Um, but I want to be able to do something unconventional and tell that story in a way that makes more sense to me. But I know a lot of people won't understand it. Um, so at this stage, I'm at a point where I'm going to continue trying to write these stories but get to a place um, where people may not be able to understand but can read them and like enter into a conversation somehow. Um, I don't, I don't know what that looks like yet, though. So I think these stories were just my attempt at like trying to imagine what that representation would look like. I don't think these stories are like ready to be like the representative samples of, of whatever I'm working on, whatever this genre is called, where I'm just trying to like think through what the world could look like, um, think through different ways of telling stories about people who look like me. Yeah. Um I don't know, I do want to, I feel like I have so much left to say about this topic. I have like 70 pages of notes that I've taken over the past like year and a half. Um, that if I ever went to grad school, like I would want to turn this into a book and turn it into a real study that includes all, you know, everything that I wasn't able to include. Um, but I think that just in the immediate future, like it's really, like my mom has looked through a little bit of it, but it's really important to me that my mom see it. Not just because obviously like I want my mom to see it, but because of the subject matter. Um, and how much she's inspired my um, interest in this particular subject matter. Um, so I don't know. Like, I don't. Really, I guess I suppose I'm in dialogue with academics. Um, I. I mean, I feel like one of the reasons why I was attracted to this specific subject was because it's been so neglected. Like there have been books and books about the child in apocalyptic cinema, but except for articles on children of men. Um, which is about um, infertility in women, although in the book it's infertility in men, which is an interesting change. Um, there really has not been a lot of literature on mothers in particularly dystopian fiction. Um, so that was a place where, if I were to enter the academic world, that's a place I would want to make an intervention in. Um, I guess, um, I mean, I think my problem was that I started this project as an independent study um, when I was abroad in Scotland. Um, and so part of that independent study was it had to be, it was a glisp, so it had to be about British movies. Um, and so the majority of my films are British, um, which means I don't, and then of course, last semester I was not motivated enough to watch many American movies. So for example, classics like Night of the Living Dead are not in my thesis. Um, and I feel like when I was making up my chapters, I was basically just sort of, I had so much research, I was just pulling out what felt like the, the easiest to write um, was, 
which is probably makes, it doesn't make for the most interesting things to write about, which is why I really do want to revisit it and revisit what's harder to write. Um, for me personally, because issues of race have not affected me personally, that's why it was not the easiest thing to write about, um, and that's why I would want to give it to the thought process that it's due. Um, I don't know, that's my thinking. <laughs> um, I had to cut out decades worth of storytelling for my final piece. Um, there's pieces that are like half done that like I'm going to submit, like I'm going to finish in the future. Um, because this world, this story is something that like I can contribute to all the time and I'm constantly thinking of new characters. And there's a character that like exists throughout all of my work um, and their name changes but it's like the same spirit. Um, so there's th this entire past that I was like, that's not relevant to this piece of story that I can also like finish in this semester. Um, because for capstone shows, you really want to create all of your work within three months. Um, so a lot got cut that like is still important, but like I also am like holding on to, and I'm writing a book over the summer, um, making and writing a book over the summer that like all those details can go into. I was trying to think, and I can't, I can't say I had to cut out a lot. I think maybe just the way that I approached writing the stories was sort of minimalist in its own right, where I think I, I told the stories I needed to tell. Um, I guess the only example I can think of is in the last story, Blood, which I talked about being like probably the most autobiographical story. Um, there was a lot that I didn't name, and I, I'm looking back on it, and I'm, I'm sort of regretting that because I think like naming things has been really important in terms of what I write. Um, but I didn't, I for example, like didn't name the city in the story. I didn't name the school that the character went to. Um, and I didn't get into a lot of the specifics about um, kind of like the, the violence that the character experienced both at the, the university and both at home. And I think a lot of that might have just been a lot of defensiveness. Like I'm very defensive both of like where I come from and Brown. Um, and I think because that story was so autobiographical, it was really hard. Um, I, I didn't want to connect it too much to myself. Um, so that might have just been a bit of fear on my part, but that's the only thing that is standing out for me in terms of what I held back on. I think the other stories, I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish with them and was able to do it with a lot of space. Like there are only four stories in the collection overall, so I had a lot of room in each of them to address what I wanted to. But I think Blood is the story um, where I restrained myself the most probably because I was the closest to it. So, wait, just so I understand, so you're asking if there's a particular compulsion as in, like, drive or motivation for why we do this particular work, or? I use the word uh, obligation or compulsion mm -hmm. specifically. It, it feels like it's something bigger than yourself, rather than something that might just be, um, you know, uh, you, you have a drive. Mm -hmm. um, one of my, like, friends and co-artists, Leeds Doris, called it writing ourselves into history and like writing ourselves into the, like art history's trajectory. And I think that's part of the com compulsion for me, is like one, telling my story, but like two, when like that young black person sees something they can relate to in like a major publication, like that is the moment that drives me. Like you are not alone is the moment that drives me. Yeah, I think I, I spoke a little bit on this earlier about um, what I was attempting to do in terms of representation in the stories. So I wrote most of the stories in the collection deal with people at different ends of different diasporas um, and people dealing with different but connected sorts of violence. So I think overall I see this project as speaking, um, being able to speak to those connections 
I think reading these stories, I'm also trying to bridge a lot of work I've done with history and with theory in my other concentration, ethnic studies, um, with the practice of writing stories. And I think it's important to have that representation and to read something um, that reflects your experiences, but also be able to read it in connection with others, uh, other experiences that may seem different, but you can see those traces of like a lot of the same sorts of violence repeating themselves like across the stories, um, but having a, like a lot of different responses to that. So I think if I'm speaking to anything bigger than myself, it's like speaking to an entire an entire history and an entire legacy of like the the impacts of violence, the impacts of like colonialism. Um, I think that's what connects all of the stories, and it's um, yeah. I think in reading in reading fiction, it's a, it's also important to be able to connect that back to history and something real. So I hope that I'm speaking to that when I write. Yeah, I think something that brings up for me is that I mean, primarily I'm a fiction writer. I don't imagine myself becoming an academic unless. I don't know, I get a ton of money somehow. Um, <laughs> but I think that um, for me, always write, I always write for myself first, um, which sounds selfish, but at the same time, I think that if you don't have that like internal compulsion, like you said, the internal compulsion to write something, I don't think it comes out as true as it could potentially be otherwise. And I think for this particular project, I wanted to be able to talk about films in ways that problematize them, because I love movies, and that's, if I were to become a journalist, that's what I would write about. Um, and I wouldn't write about Freud and Lacan um, in, you know, like Salon or whatever, but I would <laughs> hopefully be, I, I hope that this project has helped me learn how to read films in a way that reads with and against, as my favorite professor once said, um, and just sort of, I don't know, in a way that's accessible to people. I don't know. Um, a lot of my work is really physical, like I work on my apartment floor, um, so th for the piece that is 8 feet by 17 feet, like I did like a lot of like hand stamps of like stuff that you get at the craft stores, um, and just like dealing with like kind of my brain going on a tangent and like processing while also doing physical activity that like has a real output is something for me, um, and what I learned about myself is that I need time. I need space to like process things. I like process things very, very slowly, and that comes out in my work, either unintentionally or intentionally. So it's best to not fight that in my work, um, and make and not to do something fun and light when I'm not feeling fun and light. Like let myself be and create what wants to create within the confines of whatever I like. If I want to do a book, like still do the book, but it doesn't have to be something that's like a productive book or like that has a message. It can be a book that I, like light on fire. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, don't know, I guess I can go. Um, I don't know. I feel like um, this this project didn't feel as connected to my personal trauma as like a fiction piece might have. Like I am currently working on a novel type thing that does deal specifically with my particular trauma. Um, that I feel has been much harder to write, has been much more personal to write. And I think one of the good things about, maybe not good, but one of the helpful things for me about academia is it's the way to separate myself from the aspects of talking about this trauma that could be harmful or could put me back in my you know, journey towards being not traumatized or towards dealing with my trauma. Um, and I think that Learning, learning about the, the ways that you know, trauma theory has been incredibly interesting for me, and it's helped me a lot to think through, you know, beyond what you know, the therapy has done. It's, been, it's given me the terms to think through trauma in a way I wouldn't have otherwise. Um, so I don't know. I guess that's my personal connection to it. <clears throat> Thank you for that question. Um, I'm thinking about, I think, like my own process of just writing 
fiction and writing magical realist fiction in particular is my way of processing because I'm, I'm able to not distance myself but take a step back from the realities that I'm writing about and try to imagine something different and like imagine an intervention there. So I mean, the, I guess like the two stories that like are most connected to my experiences are the blood story and the bee story I talked about earlier, which are about black American young women um, dealing with different types of violence and like racist violence, um, gendered violence. Um, and so when I was writing those stories, I thought it was like especially empowering for me to like just try to imagine a way where those characters didn't have to deal with those things in the same way like I may have had to deal with them. So if I imagine like a horde of killer bees being in that story, that's like a way of empowering that character to have like a means of escape that maybe doesn't exist like right now in the real world. Um, and to imagine, I had a lot of fun just trying to turn a lot of like black home remedies, like things like your grandma tells you to do when you're sick, um, or just different superstitions around like whatever's in your house, like turning those into ways that like a character in the other story um, could like fight back against just, just a lot of different um, things that don't feel like preventable when you're actually living them. So for me, like I have a lot of fun just thinking of like how can this intervention happen and like, I don't know, I play around with it a lot and I think that's how I process is like through writing that sort of escapist fiction. I think if I was actually writing from like an academic perspective, it would be harder because I, there's no way to deny that it's real. Like this is like a real thing that's happening. And I think in the magical realist fiction, I'm not denying that it's real, but I'm imagining that it doesn't have to play out the exact same way that it does in reality. And so I think it's empowering for me to do that. And it's the way I process. Um, and I think you also asked about like something I learned about myself in the process, and I guess that's it, is that um, I, I didn't know how to articulate these stories before um, because I would always think like I had to write the story in a particular way if I was gonna tell it. Um, but freeing myself up to see how other writers have dealt with these different traumas um, and how they've used different elements of magic has been really, really fun um, and really good for my own writing in terms of like, I can think so creatively about how to deal with the world and like maybe in reality, I can't get a horde of killer bees to follow me around, but like that, I think that frame of thought allows me to think of other solutions um, and think of other ways to navigate the world. Oh.